In his second bid for the Oval Office, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders has tried to redefine and fully explain the term socialism. Last month, Sanders passionately called himself a, quote, democratic socialist, aligning himself with FDR and describing his campaign as a continuation of President Roosevelt's legacy. So Crystal and I were actually at that speech, which was matched with some mixed reviews, but what really is socialism. In his book, The Socialist Manifesto, The Case for Radical Politics in an Era of Extreme Inequality, Bhaskar Sunkara explains the history of socialism. Going back to the 1800s, he also prints a vision of where it can stand in the future. Bhaskar joins us now via Skype to discuss his book and his thoughts on socialism. He's the founder and editor of the digital magazine Jacobin. Welcome, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So tell us, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book at this time. It's obviously a very timely in terms of democratic politics and, and how you see the impact of the socialist movement in our politics today. Well, I just turned 30 a couple weeks ago, but I've been a socialist since I was 14 years old, kind of way too young to be making these kind of lifelong decisions. And I must say my initial response that I used to get when I would tell people I was a socialist was just, confusion, anger, whatever else, but it's only the last two, three years that people have been really curious and really engaged. And now there's polls showing that a majority of young people have more favorable opinions of socialism than capitalism. So I thought it was an important time to actually define and lay out uh, what it means to be a democratic socialist in the United States. And I think the core of that is just simply believing that there are certain necessities of life, people's access to healthcare, childcare, housing, nutrition, that these things uh, belong to people by virtue of just being born and, and shouldn't be bought and sold on the market like regular commodities. How does that compare to the version of democratic socialism that Bernie Sanders espouses? Well, I think Bernie Sanders would agree with that core principle. I think there, there's a little bit of a difference in emphasis where democratic socialists also talk about worker control of, of their production. So in other words, if you're working at a company with 20, 30 employees, there's no doubt there's going to be some division of labor. There's going to be managers, there's going to be foremen, there's going to be people who are regular employees. Uh, democratic socialists think, though, that we could restructure our workplaces to be more democratic so that we can elect management so that instead of getting a regular wage, we could get shares. So we believe in a different structure in the workplace, and Sanders places less emphasis on that. So you might say that a lot of what he's saying is more in tune with European social democracy, the systems that have really worked very well in places like Norway or, or historically in Sweden. Um, but, but in general, our immediate sets of demands are for things like Medicare for all, it's for things like affordable, high quality uh, college, it's for things like uh, actually funding our public schools and all these things, Sanders has actually been the forefront of the fight. So I, I see no real difference in the in the short term about what Sanders wants and, and what the democratic socialist vision is. Mm. So one thing, Bhaskar, I've seen is a big interesting debate between Aunt Elizabeth Warren and with Bernie Sanders and the theory of how you you actually accomplish some of these things. Elizabeth Warren has branded it economic patriotism, something that's essentially the same thing as what Bernie Sanders is proposing, but devoid of the word socialism. What I find interesting about you is you've embraced the label, so has Bernie Sanders, and you say, if people are going to call us socialists, then we're going to embrace it anyway. In your case, that's actually what you are. How do you see the though playing and fitting into the American story in 2020? Well, Bernie Sanders first identified as a socialist in the early 1960s. You know, he was a socialist recruited in the Young People's Socialist League. He was active in the civil rights movement and trade union struggles in the 1960s. In the 1970s, when he was running for office in Vermont, and in the 1980s, when he was uh, the mayor of Burlington, Vermont, he was a democratic socialist. That's what he called himself. So that's his record. That's the identity that he's always had. It'd be very strange if he was running for president and he ran away from his identity. And also, regardless, if you're talking about redistribution, if you're talking about the change that I think America really needs so we could all reach our potential, so we can live in a more just country, you know, they're going to call you a socialist anyway. So I think there's lots of merits to just embracing the label and explaining it, demystifying it, and, and making it less scary for most Americans. Warren doesn't have the same background. She's fighting for many valuable and important causes. But, you know, this is someone who was a registered Republican, you know, up until the late 1990s, I think. So... You know, obviously her background is different. She's going to approach these things in different different measures. I think the key difference between the candidates, though, is that Sanders has a vision of change that actually involves uh, 
working people getting together and protesting and being kind of agents of their own change. And Warren talks in this populist rhetoric, but her campaign has placed a relatively less emphasis on the need for activism and involvement and kind of revitalizing our trade unions and actually creating the kind of social movements, pushing for things like Medicare for all, whereas she's placed more of an emphasis on maybe getting the policy details right uh, than kind of hammering things out from there. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the essential difference that you see between Senator Sanders and Senator Warren is essentially the theory of political change. A lot of the goals are similar, but the way that you activate the population in order to achieve those goals is what's really different. Yeah, and I think that's really important, especially since we're going to maybe have a divided Congress, but at the very least, our system is really a gridlock system. The U.S. political system isn't working. And you, I think, need a presidential candidate and a president who could really harness the bully pulpit for change. And you're seeing little bits of it, even, I think, in the wrong direction. I, I, I think a lot of the things he's advocating for are quite odious. But Donald Trump has been able to galvanize his supporters. He's been able to get a few things passed, like these Republican tax cuts for, the, for millionaires. Uh, he's been able to do kind of change the, the nation's discourse and immigration and other things using the bully pulpit of the, the presidency. Now, what would it be like if we could use that bully pulpit, but to encourage people to start expecting more of their government when it comes to things like health care, child care, and other necessities that other countries just take for granted? You know, we don't even have any maternal leave in this, this country. So, so I think that, that you know, if, if the actual legislation is going to be a product of compromise, you might as well start without a preemptive compromise. And, and I think that is a key difference between Sanders' approach and Warren's approach. So, Bhaskar, one of the knocks always against this is that socialism polls very badly. There's an Axios poll. There's some controversy over this poll about whether, you know, majority of Americans, particularly in swing states, look very unfavorably upon the la on the label. So what? how do you reconcile it? And it goes back to my earlier question. With the American story, the American context, that many of the voters in these primaries are not people who like the label of socialism, even if they might agree with the, the policies that you're proposing. But if you look at these states, these same mm -hmm. red states, these same states where people say they don't really like socialists and self-identify more as moderates, these are states where Bernie Sanders held a huge advantage over Hillary Clinton, where Bernie Sanders is still polling relatively well. So I think that we don't need to get hung up in these terminological debates. People do believe that they're getting a raw deal. And our message to people is simple. You work hard and you're not getting enough. And the reason why you're not getting enough isn't because of minorities, it's not because of immigrants, it's because millionaires and billionaires are taking more than their fair share and keeping you in the situation that you're in. And we need a political revolution to take power away from them and to build the sort of just society that, that we all deserve. Mm -hmm. And I think that resonates, even if some of these debates about labels uh, do, not, do not resonate. So I think people are actually for a lot of socialistic policies, even if they don't like the label. They're for jobs guarantees, they're for yeah. Medicare for all, and, and they're moving along. So that, that's where our focus needs to be. Well, I, and, I mean, you don't have to imagine what people think. You can, you can look at the polls that we have, and you see that Bernie Sanders does very well among the multiracial working class, the real working class, much better, in fact, than Elizabeth Warren does among the, you know, among the white working class that's gotten so much focus in the Trump era. So we don't have to sort of imagine what people feel. We can see it in the polling. But I also wanted to ask you, um, why do you think it is that as of today, we see at least more electoral success from the, the sort of right-wing populist movement than from a leftist populist movement around the world. Well, I think, uh, I mean, it, it, the situation is different in every country. It's hard to draw broad uh, extrapolations. I would say in the United States, despite the success of Donald Trump, despite him sneaking his way into the White House by means of our terrible electoral college, uh, we're still seeing Americans have more progressive views on issues like immigration than they've had in the past. We're still seeing Americans shift uh, towards supporting things like a jobs guarantee, towards supporting Medicare for all, which I believe in the next 10 years will become a majority position among registered Republicans, much less just, just Democrats. Yeah. So I, I think you're actually shifting, feeling a shift in this nation's discourse towards the left, even at the same time when 
you know, the presidency was obviously won by by a Trump administration that's maintained a solid block of, you know, what, 40 to 43 percent, you know, if, if looking at looking at polling. Um, it was enough factoring in how unpopular Hillary Clinton was. It was enough factoring in how many people who probably vaguely supported Hillary Clinton over Trump just decided to stay at home because they didn't like any candidate. It was enough to win the White House. But I don't think it's enough to create a lasting coalition. Um, you know, I hope I'm right. Maybe I'm not. Sure. But, but I, I think there has been a lot of success from progressives and not just in these safe blue seats. Bosker, Senator Sanders draws a line between FDR, as we mentioned, and his four freedoms and his view that we have to be radical for a generation and himself. Do you do you sort of agree with that line being drawn? Was FDR fundamentally a socialist? No, FDR was not a socialist. A socialist at the time uh, thought that FDR was a well-intentioned figure who was fighting for many of the right causes, but was sometimes swayed by the left, sometimes swayed by people to his right, and that had to be pressured and challenged into creating a program in, the, in favor of working people. And in the end, the New Deal was the last time when there was mass movements of trade unions and people on the streets demanding a better future, but also really people in the government also advocating for social change. And it was a very positive period in American history. What Sanders points to, though, is the radical, unfulfilled promise of FDR. So when FDR talks about the need for a new Bill of Rights, a Bill of Rights to guarantee the core necessities of life to every American by virtue of being born, you know, that that's not part of the actual New Deal. That was some proposals that FDR put forward about a year before his death. So I think that's really useful to bring up as far as our unfulfilled promise. I think certainly FDR was, was our best president of the 20th century. But uh, you know, I, I think that we need to think about the New Deal as what it actually accomplished and also what was unfulfilled. And we need to unfulfill the, you know, we need to actually accomplish what was unfulfilled with a new uh, New Deal for the 21st century. One last cue for you, Bosker. Um, control room wants us to let you go, but I don't want to let you go. Um, <laughs> you know what Trump and others would say is basically like, okay, you say socialism, we say Venezuela, or we say USSR, none of which worked out well. Explain why that is the wrong way to look at things. Well, democratic socialists in this country have been on the right side of every single battle to make us a more just and equal society. Uh, the original left, you could say, was a major part of the first abolitionist movement and the creation of the Republican Party and the ending of slavery in the United States. We fought for the eight-hour day. We fought to extend suffrage to all Americans, regardless of their race, regardless of their gender. We fought to create unions. We fought to create the types of policies that actually allowed for upward mobility for working people in the United States. So I I'm very proud of our record in the United States. Uh, I think it's important that we oppose authoritarianism in all forms, but just like we don't associate American libertarians with Pinochet in Chile, you know, I think it's kind of ridiculous to associate democratic socialism with the Soviet Union. That's, that's a fair point. We, th we appreciate you joining us, Bosker. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Bosker. Congrats Thank on the book. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We'll have more rising for you after this.